How Satellites Work Hello everyone. This is 3Z. Don't forget subscribe. A satellite is essentially a self-contained communication system that can receive messages from Earth and retransmit those signals back using a transponder, which is a radio signal receiver and transmitter that is built inside a satellite. For the duration of its anticipated operational life, which can last up to 20 years, a satellite must endure the shock of being accelerated during launch up to an orbital velocity of 28,100 kilometers, 17,500 miles per hour and a hostile space environment where it can be exposed to radiation and extreme temperatures. Additionally, satellites must be lightweight because the price of launching a satellite is high and depending on weight. Satellites must be compact and constructed of strong, lightweight materials in order to overcome these requirements. They must perform with an extremely high reliability of more than 99.9% .9 in the absence of any possibility of maintenance or repair. The communication system, which consists of antennae and transponders that receive and retransmit signals, the power system, which includes solar panels that supply power, and the propulsion system, which consists of rockets that move the satellite, are the three primary parts of a satellite. A satellite needs its own propulsion system to place it in the proper orbit and to periodically correct its position. Because of the moon's and sun's gravitational attraction, a satellite in a geostationary orbit can move up to a degree every year from north to south or east to west of its position. To change its location, a satellite has thrusters that are occasionally fired. Station keeping is the process of maintaining a satellite's orbital position, and attitude control is the process of making adjustments by utilizing the satellite's thrusters. The amount of fuel required to power these thrusters determines the lifespan of a satellite. The satellite eventually wanders into space as its fuel runs out, ceasing to function and becoming space junk. Over the course of its lifetime, a satellite in orbit must remain operational continually. To run its electronic systems and communications payload, it needs internal power. Sunlight is the primary energy source, and the satellite solar panels are used to capture it. Additionally, a satellite has batteries on board to supply electricity when the Earth blocks the sun. When there is sunlight, the extra current produced by the solar panels is used to recharge the batteries. Satellites may be exposed to radiation in space and operate in temperatures between 150 and 300 degrees Celsius. Aluminum and other radiation-resistant materials are used to shelter satellite components from radiation. The thermal system of a satellite safeguards its delicate mechanical and electronic components and keeps it operating at its ideal temperature to ensure continuous operation. The thermal system of a satellite also shields delicate satellite components from sudden fluctuations in temperature by turning on cooling mechanisms during periods of excessive heat or heating systems during periods of extreme cold. A satellite's tracking, telemetry, and control system, TTNC, allows for two-way communication with TTNC on the ground. In doing so, a ground station is able to monitor a satellite's location and manage its propulsion, thermal, and other systems. It may also keep an eye on a satellite's temperature, electrical voltages, and other crucial factors. Microsatellites under 1 kilogram, 2.2 pounds, and huge spacecraft over 6,500 kilograms are examples of communication satellites, 14,000 pounds. Over time, improvements in digitalization and downsizing have greatly expanded satellite capacity. Early Bird only had one transponder that could transmit one TV station. In comparison, the Boeing 702 series of satellites can have more than 100 transponders, and each transponder can have up to 16 channels thanks to digital compression technology, providing more than 1,600 TV channels via a single satellite. Low Earth Orbit, LEO, Medium Earth Orbit, MEO, and Geostationary Orbit, GEO are the three orbital planes in which satellites can be found, GEO. LEO satellites orbit the Earth at a height of 160 to 1,600 kilometers, 100 to 1,000 miles, 10,000 to 20,000 kilometers, 6,300 to 12,500 miles from Earth is the operating range for MEO satellites. 
Satellites do not operate between LEO and MEO because the Van Allen radiation belt creates an unfavorable environment for electronic components there. GEO satellites orbit the Earth at a height of 35,786 kilometers, 22,236 miles, making one orbit every 24 hours while maintaining a fixed location over a single point. As was already established, only three GEO satellites are required to give worldwide coverage, but 20 or more LEO spacecraft and 10 or more MEO satellites are required to cover the entire planet. Additionally, tracking antennas on the ground are needed to connect satellites seamlessly when talking with them in LEO and MEO. A signal that is reflected off a GEO satellite travels from Earth to the satellite and back in around 0.22 seconds when traveling at the speed of light. Applications like voice services and mobile telephony may experience issues as a result of this delay. Because GEO satellites have intrinsic latency, the majority of mobile and voice services typically employ LEO or MEO satellites to prevent signal delays. Because they can cover a wider region of the ground than other satellites, GEO satellites are typically employed for broadcasting and data applications. A very strong multistage rocket is needed to launch a satellite into orbit and place it in the proper location. From locations including the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, Kourou in French Guiana, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, Xichang in China, and Tanegashima Island in Japan, satellite launch companies launch satellites using their own rockets. Signals used in satellite communications are transmitted and received in the very high frequency range of 1 to 50 gigahertz, gigahertz, 1 gigahertz equals 1 billion hertz. The frequency ranges or bands are designated by letters L dash, S dash, C dash, X dash, Q dash, K dash, and V bands, in order from low to high frequency. Larger antennas are required to receive signals in the lower range, L dash, S dash, and C bands, of the satellite frequency spectrum due to their low power transmission. As a result of the higher power of the signals in the X, Q, K, and V bands of this spectrum, dishes as tiny as 45 centimeters, 18 inches, in diameter can receive them. Due of this, the Ku band and Ka band spectrum are perfect for mobile phone and data applications, broadband data communications, and direct to home, DTH, broadcasts. Satellite communications are governed by the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, a special UN body. Applications for the use of satellite orbital slots are submitted to and approved by the ITU, which has its headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. The World Radio Communication Conference, which the ITU convenes every two to four years, is in charge of allocating frequencies to various applications in various parts of the world. These rules are enforced by each nation's telecommunications regulatory body, which also grants licenses to users of different frequencies. The Federal Communications Commission is the regulatory organization in the U.S. that oversees frequency allocation and licensing. Satellite-related uses A thriving satellite services industry has emerged as a result of advancements in satellite technology, offering a range of services to broadcasters, internet service providers, ISPs, governments, the military, and other industries. Data communications, broadcasting, and telecommunications are the three categories of communication services that satellites offer. Telephone calls and services offered to wireless, mobile, and cellular network providers as well as telephone businesses are examples of telecommunication services. Direct-to-consumer radio and television as well as mobile broadcasting services are all considered broadcasting services. Households directly get DTH, or satellite television, services, such as the Direct TV and DISH network services in the United States. Satellite is mostly used to provide cable and network content to local stations and affiliates. The distribution of programs to mobile devices like laptops, PDAs, and cell phones is another crucial function of satellites. Transferring data from one location to another is a component of data communications. Through the use of very small aperture terminal, VSAT, networks, 
corporations, and other organizations that need to transmit financial and other information between their various locations employ satellites to make this process easier. As the internet has expanded, a sizable portion of internet traffic now travels by satellite, making ISPs one of the biggest users of satellite services. When land-based communication capabilities are unavailable during emergencies and natural catastrophes, satellite communications technology is frequently utilized. Emergency communication services can be provided in disaster zones using mobile satellite equipment. The Future of Satellite Communication Satellite technology has advanced from the experimental Sputnik in 1957 to the sophisticated and potent in a relatively short period of time. Mega constellations with tens of thousands of satellites are being developed to provide internet access everywhere on Earth. Future communication satellites will be more powerful, feature larger antennas, and more onboard computer capability, allowing them to manage more bandwidth. The service life of satellites will expand from the present 10 to 15 years to 20 to 30 years with further advancements in their propulsion and power systems. Additionally, other technological advancements like inexpensive reusable launch vehicles are in the works. There is no shortage of new applications that will increase demand for satellite services in the years to come as increased video, audio, and data traffic demands more bandwidth. The need for increased bandwidth, along with ongoing advancements in satellite technology, will guarantee the commercial satellite sector's long-term survival well into the 21st century. Radio through satellite. Compared to traditional radio, satellite radio broadcasts audio signals with higher consistency and clarity over huge areas. One or more satellites orbiting the Earth receive the signal from a ground station to operate a satellite radio service. The satellite sends the signal back to specialized ground receivers, which are often found in cars and home stereos. The signal can cover an entire continent because it is transmitted from space. In urban locations where tall structures could interfere with the signal, ground-based repeaters strengthen it. The Electromagnetic Spectrum's 2.3 GHz S-band is where satellite radio operates in the United States. Elsewhere, it frequently uses the 1.4 GHz L-band. The majority of satellite radio providers use a subscription business model. A proprietary receiver is purchased by a customer, who then purchases a subscription to activate it. The encrypted digital signals from the satellite can be decoded by a receiver once it's turned on. Compared to traditional radio, satellite radio often provides a significantly clearer signal and a wider dynamic range, frequently reaching the audio quality of compact discs CDs. Usually, services have 100 or more channels available, including music, news, discussion, and sports. Numerous networks don't have any ads. Rivals XM Satellite Radio and Sirius Satellite Radio, which debuted in 2001 and 2002, respectively, engaged in a battle to woo high-profile talent like talk show host Oprah Winfrey and radio personality Howard Stern. However, the division of high-profile celebrities between the two services, along with a comparable division in sports content, hurt both businesses. Due to mounting debt, the two businesses combined in 2008, forming Sirius XM Radio, which took over as the only satellite radio service in the United States, they remained separate entities in Canada. Transition to the Communications Act Compared to the change from the Radio Act of 1912 to the Radio Act of 1927, the transition from the Radio Act of 1927 to the Communications Act of 1934 went reasonably smoothly. There was already a system in place to enforce the law, and there was order on the airwaves. However, the 1934 Communications Act did result in change. At President Franklin D. Roosevelt's request, the 34-page Communications Act of 1934 was passed on June 19 and established a permanent administrative body, the FCC. It largely integrated the Radio Act of 1927, including its tenets of public ownership of the airwaves and the PICN standard. The Interstate Commerce Commission was replaced with the Federal Communications Commission, and the FCC was given broader regulatory authority over all radio telephone activity, including the newly emerging broadcast media FM radio and television, as well as the wire and wireless common carrier industries, which had been under the control of the Department of Commerce.
Don't forget subscribe.